The king of Egypt said to the Hebrew midwives, whose names were Shifra and Pura, when you are helping the Hebrew women during childbirth on the delivery stool, if you see that the baby is a boy, kill him. But if it is a girl, let her live. The midwives, however, feared God and did not want to do what the king of Egypt had told them to do. They let the boys live. Then the king of Egypt summoned the midwives and asked them, why have you done this? Why have you let the boys live? The midwives answered Pharaoh, Hebrew women are not like Egyptian women. They are vigorous and give birth before the midwives arrive. So God was kind to the midwives and the people increased and became even more numerous. And because the midwives feared God, he gave them families of their own. Good morning, church. Happy Sabbath. Shabbat Shalom. Oh boy, uh, it's been a rough week for us in my family. As I mentioned earlier, uh, my boys went on camp earlier this week and they are just super, super sick. So I'm hoping that they're tuning in on YouTube this morning. But um, I just want to welcome you all to church today. And for those who are joining us online, welcome. Uh, for those who don't know me and those tuning into our YouTube channel for the first time, I'm Grace. And it's been a while since I've stood up here to do a presentation. I think, in fact, the last one was not in church. It was over Zoom when we were all in lockdown last year. Um, so talking to a congregation in a church again definitely feels a lot more natural, a lot less daunting than simply just talking to a computer screen. Still got some nerves going on though, so that doesn't ever go away. And I just want to thank um, Andrew and and Ernie for for offering their their support and um, and and praying for me and um, and and making sure that I'm okay up here up front this morning. The nerves are still there though. Anyway, so this Sabbath is actually dedicated as Women's Ministry Emphasis Day. And with that, the title of my presentation is Heroines of Faithfulness, the story of Shifra and Pua. Uh, just as we read earlier um, in the scripture reading, and thank you again, Joyce, for that reading, we're going to explore how these two women were fundamental in God's plan for the Israelite people. We look at how Shifra and Pua's fear of the Lord helped them find courage and the voice to speak up for justice and righteousness on his behalf. And as we work through their story in this first chapter of Exodus, we will delve into what it means for us today to fear God. Before we begin, let's pray. Dear Heavenly Gracious Father, we thank you, Lord, for this blessed Sabbath day. We thank you so much for our church family. And as we dedicate this Sabbath to the women's ministry and the women of our church who bring their gifts and talents to glorify you, we ask for the Holy Spirit to be among us today. I pray that the words that I speak only come from you, Lord. May the Holy Spirit touch the hearts and open the minds of both our sisters and brothers in our church family. We pray these things in your holy and precious name. Amen. So, an entire generation has ended since Joseph was second in command. And now there's a new pharaoh. And this one has chosen to forget all the good deeds Joseph has done in preserving Egypt during its time of famine. And as they multiplied in the land of Egypt, the Israelites were becoming powerful, causing the pharaoh to feel threatened. So he threw the Israelites into slavery. And even in this terrible oppression, God still blesses his people and they continued to multiply. So the pharaoh takes it up a notch, and he draws up a drastic plan, and it's a sinister strategy to stop this relentlessly increasing population of God's people. He commands every Hebrew newborn baby boy to be killed, and he was expecting everyone to back him up, to obey him without protest or debate. And so enter our heroines, Shifra and Pua. 
And while their primary responsibility was to help bring lives into the world, they find themselves defiantly standing up to an evil Egyptian king. And even despite the possibility of being sentenced to death for their disobedience, it's their fear of the Lord that helps them not only see what is wrong in Pharaoh's plan, but it pushed them to do something about it. And it's important to note here that this act of genocide to wipe out all male babies was not merely a cruel plan of an evil pharaoh. There were greater cosmic powers at play, with Satan himself engaging in a great controversy with God. As Ellen G. White writes in Patriarchs and Prophets, Satan was the mover in this matter. He knew that a deliverer was to be raised up among the Israelites, and by leading the king to destroy their children, he hoped to defeat the divine purpose. So in this spiritual war, Satan was trying to stop God's plan for salvation. By killing all Hebrew newborn males, there would be no hope for the Messiah to enter this sinful world. God needed faithful warriors to stand against Satan. God needed Shifra and Pua to do that. And in verse 17, it says, But the midwives feared God and did not do as the king of Egypt commanded them. Why have you done this thing and saved the male children alive? And here is a defining moment where the midwives took up God's challenge. They faced a pharaoh filled with rage in their disobedience. Why are the male children still alive? The pharaoh screams. But God blesses Shifra and Pua with wisdom and the discernment to come up with a creative, clever, dare we say even cheeky, reply. And the midwife said to Pharaoh, because the Hebrew women are not like the Egyptian women, for they are lively and give birth before the midwives come to them. Who's ever heard of that? Not a pharaoh, let alone any man, would have been able to come up with an appropriate comeback. So, let's explore what it means to fear the Lord. When we think of the word fear, we may perhaps initially think of it, you know, in a negative connotation. Does the fear of the Lord make us feel threatened? Do we feel in danger if we disobey God? Does it mean we need to run away from him? because we fall short as Christians. Looking at Shifra and Pua, how does the fear of the Lord lead two humble midwives to stand up against the commands of the highest Egyptian authority? What makes this fear different? So in Hebrew, the fear of the Lord is translated to, and is there anyone of Jewish background? Ah, Seriana, she might correct me if I'm wrong here. Girah, is that right? Girah. And in my research, I discovered that it can mean awe or reverence. To have yirah is to be in awe in complete reverence of God's grace, his mercy, his love, his creation. This kind of fear also includes wonderment, amazement, astonishment, and gratitude, even mystery. And when we're standing, and when we're in this understanding of just how mighty and great God is, when we come to him in reverence and awe, don't we just want to obey him, follow his will? Deuteronomy chapter 10, verses 12 to 13, we see how the fear of the Lord was an important fundamental aspect for God's people. Not only as he guided them, but set some rules for them. And he says, and now Israel, what does the Lord your God require of you? But to fear the Lord your God, to walk in all his ways and to love him, to serve the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and to keep the commandments of the Lord and his statutes, which I command you today for your good. And how relevant does this rule apply to us today? So a few years ago, I bought myself a new toy. No, it wasn't a fancy car, it wasn't a new home, new clothes. It was a 
a digital camera. And I was getting very trigger happy, snapping away of anything and everything. It was my children, the ocean, flowers, anything with colour, light and shadow, shapes and forms. And one late winter's afternoon, my husband came home and said, you have to go outside and take photos this evening. They say the sunset is going to be amazing. And you know, here in Sydney, we were truly blessed with the most amazing sunsets. Like, who saw the one last night? It was amazing. So I was curious how much more amazing this sunset was going to be. So off I rushed, driving down to a quiet spot. I found a little area here in the eastern suburbs where the view of the Harbour Bridge and the Opera House. We're very blessed to have those kind of views here. And I quickly set up my camera. And the sun began to set and I could see something incredible happening. Within a fleeting hour, the sky turned from a dusty orange and then to this vibrant, vibrant burnt gold. No filters, by the way. This is all straight from a camera. Then just when you thought God's magnificence had hit its peak in this sunset show, God displayed in the sky beautiful tinges of pink. And then he thought, okay, here's a grand finale. There was purple. So I was so overwhelmed by this energy and magnificence of this incredible palette of colours in the sky, I just sat on the bench. And it's then I remember praying, Heavenly Father, I am humbled by your creation, your blessings, your works, your awesomeness. You know, the next day, thousands of photos appeared on websites and social media. I don't know if anyone remembered that sunset. It was 2014, I think. And everyone was in absolute awe. They even called it the sunset that almost broke the internet. But the fear of God can break down so much more. It can turn our doubts into a steadfast belief in God's capabilities. It calls us to be reverent and to be completely, utterly humbled by his divine magnificence. A fear of God is our call to worship him, to obey his will. Proverbs 9 verse 10, I don't know if you can read that, but it tells us, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. And the knowledge of the Holy One is understanding. You know, unlike our own fear of the world, our fear of God helps us realise that everything starts and ends with him. A fear of God is a complete surrender to his higher ways and divine judgment. Acknowledging God as the beginning and the end knowing he is the author of our lives, is to have complete faith in him. And we need to know that only he can give us a deeper spiritual insight to how this world works. And even in the unanswerable questions and mysteries, we can take comfort in knowing we can leave it all to our divine creator. As the eldest daughter of a pastor... A certain young woman couldn't afford the tuition fees of a Seventh-day Adventist college. It was the late 1950s and in her country of Indonesia. And uh, at that time, Indonesia was coming out of war, but it was still struggling with political unrest. There were riots, killings and severe poverty. And to get through her studies and to graduate, this woman took on a, on a job as a coal porter. Does anyone know what a coal porter is? The younger generation won't, but yes. So yeah, it's selling books. So this young woman sold books during her school holidays so she could earn herself a scholarship to get herself through university. And only students who sold the most books qualified. So that's what she did to get by. Literature evangelism, I believe, it, it isn't far from door-to-door -door sales. And from experience, I know sales is a tough job at the best of times.
But this young woman had all the odds stacked against her. She was selling Christian-based religious books in a Muslim country, a country where smoking clove cigarettes isn't just a common habit, it's part of the daily diet. And with a school friend, she would carry around heavy books every day. Books written by Ellen G. White about health and nutrition, as well as magazines like Signs of the Times. Knocking on every household door, they didn't miss a single street. Once they, that once they visited one side of the street, the next day they were knocking on the doors on the other side. And this was their work every day until all the houses were visited. And this young woman, she had steel determination. But most importantly, she had a deep, sincere love for Jesus. She would sell her books to Muslims who smoked like chimneys, but they still wanted to read about what it meant to have a healthier lifestyle. Her fear of God overrode her fear of dangerous streets and strangers. Instead, it took her to so many different households, meeting so many different people to spread the gospel. And I guess it's here I can mention that this woman in, my, in this story, it's my mum. And after graduating from the Seven Day Adventist College in East Java, my mum continued to work for the church. And just when she thought God had sent her plenty of challenges as a coal porter, she was then asked to lead the children's Sabbath school ministry. With no qualifications to teach or having her own children yet, mum was terrified to take on the role. But take on the role she did. And one of my mum's fondest memories is corralling the village children under a tree inviting them to Sabbath school. And there she would teach young kids, mostly from Muslim families, about creation and about God's love. And 30 years later, after mum had well and truly left Indonesia and migrated to Australia with her own family, she went back to Indonesia for a holiday. She stopped over at that little village for a visit. Just as she, visit, just as she arrived at the train station, mum heard someone calling out her name. Mum couldn't believe it. How could someone recognise her? After all these years? Why did this lady suddenly come up, greeting her with a big hug? Do you remember my sons? The stranger asked my mum. You taught them Sabbath school under that big tree, the lady said. When this lady mentioned her sons' names, my mum's memory sparked. Ah, yes, yes, my mum did remember them. This lady continued to say, well, thanks to you and your Sabbath school, they're both Seventh-day Adventists now. And guess what, she said. Because of our sons, my husband and I became Seventh-day Adventists too. Being faithful to God, being in fear of him, simply means to trust that we just need to do his work. The rest he will provide. And it leads me to one of my favourite verses. Proverbs chapter 3, verse 5. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him and he shall direct your paths. Do not be wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord and depart from evil. When my mum told me her story, I was really curious. Where did she find her courage? Her determination to keep going day after day, carrying heavy books and selling them to Muslim homes. So I asked her, weren't you scared? And uh, she told me to get through every day, to keep strong and courageous in God's service. She sang this particular hymn to herself. And if you know it, Feel free to sing along. Anywhere with Jesus I will safely go. Anywhere he leads me in this world below. Anywhere without him dearest joys would fade. Anywhere with Jesus I am not afraid. Anywhere, anywhere, fear I cannot know. 
Anywhere with Jesus I will safely go. Amen. Let's sing like that every Sabbath. <laughs> we just need to go where God is, where he calls us, where he knows our talents and gifts can help make a difference to someone's spiritual journey. Most importantly, like the hymn says, when we fear God, when we put all our trust and faith in him, the fears of the world, we can let go. And we don't have to look too far to see and feel that there's a shift happening in our society and how important inclusion has become for women. For instance, our new government has the most number of, of women in cabinet. We look around and hear about how the Me Too movement gives women a voice they never had before. And I would argue that there are very few Australians who don't know who Grace Tame and Brittany Higgins are. Strong, confident young women who are leading out the campaign here in Australia to stop, stop sexual harassment, gender and child abuse and domestic violence. These are important turning points for women today and for future generations. But we don't need to simply leave it up to the secular world to speak up for social justice. Just like Shifra and Pua, who stood up to the Pharaoh, God also wants us to speak, speak up when we encounter something that's unrighteous in his eyes. God gives us clarity and purpose to do what's right. He gives us the boldness and courage to bring our opinions forward when we see something that doesn't meet with his divine character. And just like Joshua, God will often call those who may not necessarily seem qualified, but their faith and fear of God makes them the right candidate. In Joshua verse, chapter 1, verse 9 reads, Have I not commanded you? Be strong and of good courage. Do not be afraid, nor be dismayed, for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. Your faith and your voice are just like muscles. Every difficulty, every hardship we face is a divine opportunity to grow and strengthen our faith and confidence in our speech. Like Shifra and Pua, God will lead those who fear him. Bless them with courage, bravery and a confident voice and to not be embarrassed or shy about Sabbath keeping or choices in clean foods over unclean. And especially, we don't need to be timid in our love for Jesus. A few weeks ago, we were blessed to have the young women of our church come up and share their testimonies. We had some young men too and, you know, Ethan and, and, and Will, thank you for yours. But I really want to mention Nina, Leah, and Eleanor. And I think I can speak on behalf of all those who were in the congregation that Sabbath, how wonderful it was to see the Holy Spirit working with our youth, especially our young girls, how strong their conviction was in their love for Jesus. So let's go back to our story of Shifra and Pua. Two women whose job was simply to safely simply to, to bring babies safely into the world. But they could see that their job description had a spiritual aspect to it. They knew without hesitation, without an inkling of doubt, that God called them to make a difference. And in our lives today, we need to ask ourselves, do we question our own position? Do we stand down in fear? Do we become timid or shy? especially when there's the chance it may create some friction or get us into trouble? Even in our own church, are we vigilant in speaking up when we see something's not quite right? How often do we feel intimidated or discouraged in church because someone has spoken over us, leaving us with little left to say? The story of Shifra and Pua can remind us how we can build courage to speak up. We can learn how as a church... As a community, we can do things differently. To be more creative, encouraging each other to bring new, fresh ideas to our church family. 
Now, these aren't questions or thoughts we need to immediately address, but they're certainly ones we can start to think from about from today. And of course, some of our ideas will work and some won't. But if we try, if, but if we are to try and walk our lives as Jesus did, who, who himself went through so many trials and tribulations, discouragement, and also being violated, can't we apply what we know of our Saviour Jesus Christ to our own lives today? You know, after two years of lockdowns, isolation, uncertainty, and most of all, fear, the world is now talking about recovery, pandemic recovery, they call it. Employment, businesses, government, schools, and education, every aspect of our society is rebuilding, all trying to recoup from our losses. Whether you're sitting next to them in church this morning or someone random on the street, I don't think there's a single person who hasn't been affected by COVID-19 in one way or another. There's still a lot of healing to be done, physically, mentally, emotionally, and most of all, spiritually. As people, in, as people in society in general are still finding their feet after a global pandemic, I believe our church is also in recovery mode. Our church had to quickly scramble to make sure we could still worship online. But the blessings from that were immeasurable. There were those who grew their faith through the Zoom Sabbath school. I, for one, was one of them. I love how we can now type up Bulara Seventh-day Adventist Church on YouTube and we can see dozens and dozens of sermons and past live streams. We now have so much content available for those who are seeking God. And now here we are, back in church, and we can't help but realise there's so much more to recover, so many seats to fill again and to bring more members back into Sabbath school and, in, and experience the interactive and spiritual, spiritually uplifting Bible discussions that come from it. But we're getting there, and the Holy Spirit is leading our women's ministry. We have our own heroines of faithfulness leading our church through the post-pandemic recovery. There's something extremely exciting happening in our church, and beyond recovery, it's a revival. Last Sunday, we were blessed to have a Pentecost brunch. You know, within a few short weeks, our sister Joyce managed to quickly prepare the event, reaching out to our Jewish friends. And we warmed up our church hall downstairs with worship, prayer, singing, eating delicious food, and simply rejuvenating our faith. And uh, an ADRA initiative, the Blossom Project, is instrumental in helping and educating women in Vanuatu with difficult social issues, such as teenage pregnancy and domestic violence. And our, Wil and our Wallara Women's Ministry is busily organising a fundraising event. And I might add that I got that date wrong. It's not the 19th, it's the 9th. Is that right, Kerry? Yes, yeah, sorry, it's the 9th. So we, on the 9th, we have scheduled a dinner for all our church members and their friends and family. Everyone's invited, so come along. And we have a trash and treasure auction to raise funds. And it goes without saying, arranging something like this, especially only months out of COVID, it's a huge effort by the women in our ministry. It will take a family, a church family, to put this all together. Our sister Kerry has worked tirelessly in rounding the church women to make heart pillows for breast cancer patients. These pillows have provided comfort and relief for patients who are recovering from mastectomies. And they are so grateful for our pillows, women have reached out on our church Facebook page to thank us. And due to popular demand, hospitals have requested our ministry sew bags for patients who need to carry their drain bags post mastectomy surgery. And one patient also reached out to thank us. God is working through us all the time, amen? And as we're changing leadership in our women's ministry, I'd just like to take this opportunity to thank Kerry 
for everything she's done. God has truly used her as his vessel in helping the women of our church to keep spiritually uplifted and strong and to keep reaching out to our community. And Christelle's not here this morning, but she is our new leader. And I, I ask you to join me in welcome, welcoming her in leading the, the, the women's ministry. And I jo ask you to join me to pray for her and then pray that the Holy Spirit will guide her as we enter this new chapter. You know, yet amongst all this activity, we still have so much to do. There will always be so much to do until Jesus returns on that glorious morning. Amen? So when I tell my secular friends how our church is still finding its feet after the pandemic, how hard it's been for so many of us to return to church, they ask me, Grace, why? Why do you bother? What's in it for you? And I wonder, do they have a valid point? Why do we bother with church? Why does it matter so much? There are so many obstacles we face that, we can, that it can cause us to become so easily despondent. Our faith is trialled and tested all the time. Being cynical and negative can easily become our default, especially in difficult times. So I simply tell my friends about how much I love Jesus, how much I love my church and my sisters. When God has done so much for me, for us, how can we ignore his call? Our fear of the Lord takes our faith to a place of awe, reverence and wonderment. What God has done for each and every one of us is immeasurable. The blessings we know about and those we don't. The little service we have to offer to our Heavenly Father is the most minuscule of portions compared to the abundance of love, grace and mercy he provides us. So to summarise, there's three major takeaways from Shifra and Pua's story. Fear of God is not the same as fear of man. It does not hold the same negative message. In fact, the fear of God reduces our fear of man and increases our faith in our Heavenly Father. To fear God is to be in awe of God, to hold reverence and to be humble in his magnificence and grace. And, and in all that wonderment and gratitude for what he's done for us, we run to him, not away from him. To fear God is to fear a God who is just and merciful. He guides us to discern what is unjust or wrong, and instead, we can work towards what is good and righteous, while also helping and supporting our neighbours and friends and all those who need God in their lives. You know, in only six short verses of Exodus chapter 1, God gave Shifra and Pua a job that could have easily cost them their lives a job that they went ahead and performed without question, without doubt. And in their obedience to God, rather than man, they helped save the entire Hebrew race. They were instrumental in protecting God's divine purpose for salvation in Jesus Christ. With the fear of the Lord in their spiritual engine, Shifra and Pua boldly heeded to his calling. Let the Holy Spirit help you do the same today. Let's pray. Lord, Heavenly Father, thank you so much, Lord, for the story of Shifra and Pua. We thank you for our women's ministry, that despite the challenging times our church has faced these past two years, the Holy Spirit is guiding us through our next step of revival. 
We humbly offer our gifts and talents to you, Lord, and our love and commitment to you. May we always glorify your name. Bless our church and help each and every one of us to be a blessing to others. May the Holy Spirit help us to support each other, encourage each other to walk in faith with you. May we always be a faithful servant for you. In your holy and precious name we pray. Amen.